Um, so welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming. I can't see you. It's very strange, but um, I'm sure you guys are used to this by now. Um, there's just one problem I need to um, um, tell you. <laughs> uh, we're in an at-home situation and my I'm running out of internet megabytes. So um, halfway through the talk, I will need to refresh my internet a few times and I hope I do that on time to keep the connection. If something goes wrong, I will do my best to be back as soon as possible. Um, so if you see me looking down, it's me checking my internet and um, I hope it doesn't just disturb the flow of the talk too much. Um, all right, so um, I'm Sjoerd Gruskamp, I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, I'll briefly tell you uh, uh, who I am and then uh, we'll get straight to, uh, to the talk. Okay, let's go. Um, thanks, by the way, uh, David, for inviting me to this, uh, to this talk. And here we go, look at this. Okay, so uh, how did I get here? Well, I did a Bachelor of Physics in Utrecht University. Um, after that, I uh, did a Master of Physics there, uh, or actually a Master in Meteorology, Oceanography and Climate at uh, IMAO and at the NEOS Institute. Um, after that, I went to Tasmania in Australia to uh, do a PhD in Quantitative Marine Science. Uh, I worked there with uh, Trevor McDougall. Uh, for about uh, three and a half years, uh, after which I went to work with Ryan Abernathy at um, the Le Mans d'Or the Earth Observatory in um, New York City at Columbia University. Did a another postdoc in Sydney, so I've been going back and forth a little bit around the world, um, and then finally landed back on Tessel, um, where I was born and raised, and where there is also an oceanographic institute in the Netherlands called the NEOS. And that's where I'm a tenure tracker at the moment. And the main topic of what I do is ocean mixing. So let me quickly check my internet again, how fast is this going? So that's the main topic of what I'm doing. And uh, I do also have some other um, research interests, which is, for example, the water mass transformation framework. Uh, water mass transformation is a way to look at ocean circulation, especially that of properties such as temperature, salinity, carbon. Um, but it's not a Eulerian way or a Lagran Lagrangian way of looking at ocean circulation. It's a complementary way to that, if you uh, want to put it that way. And uh, it is a very nice framework to do interdisciplinary research between physics, biogeochemistry, and climate. Um, and if you want to know more about that, I would refer to a, a review paper that we wrote for Annual Review of Marine Science. Um, I also recently got some attention talking about um, a study of the Northern European Enclosure Dam, where we um, closed the entire North Sea to save a lot of countries for uh, sea level rise. Um, and I was planning on doing a few slides on that today, but time limitations will not allow for that. Um, but if you have any questions about that, we can talk about it or afterwards or, or, or some other day. Um, for the Canadians, it's also on uh, CBC Quirks and Quarks, and on my website you can find lots of links where I talk about that. Okay, um, but the topic of today really is ocean mixing, and that's um, that's one of the things I've mostly been uh, working on. And this is a very nice schematic that tries to um, show a little bit of how ocean mixing works, where you have the different ingredients, the different water masses, the different kind of mixing represented by the blender and its positions that you can put it on, and then you get all the water masses. Um, unfortunately, it's not really that simple. Um, it's a bit more complicated. But it is very important because mixing um, or not knowing mixing is, is, is a big problem, in fact. Uh, key aspects of the Earth climate system depend on accurate representation of turbulent mixing. So we're talking anything from meridional overturning circulation, large-scale climate processes, but also things like oxygen minimum zones. And basically, all numerical studies, they one way or another have to put mixing in their numerical models. And so, uh, mixing becomes uh, a, a very important key to oceanography. And um, one of the biggest problems is that we mixing is very hard to measure. And so we need alternative ways to estimate the strength of mixing that we can use to put into numerical models. And that's what I work on. Um, so let's start a little bit with mixing. So mixing um, is basically happening on the molecular scales. And um, that means, for example, heat diffuses molecularly, but also matter. 
And um, the thing is that stirring can enhance that type of mixing. So for example, if you take your coffee cup, if you put milk in your coffee cup, uh, if you just let it sit there, we, by the time that the coffee and the milk has uh, mixed through the fusion, uh, it, your coffee might be evaporated, it will definitely be cold and you wouldn't want to drink it anymore. So what we do, we take our spoon and, and we start stirring it. And because we stir it, we allow for more milk and coffee molecules to be close to each other and, and mix together. So you're, you're increasing the amount of gradients that are happening in your coffee cup through which the diffusion and the mixing can take place. So the stirring by the spoon is basically enhancing the mixing on the molecular scales. And this can be represented mathematically by using a diffusivity, uh, the D, which is basically the strength of your stirring, uh, times gradients of milk in this case. And, um, uh, but it could be a gradient of temperature, salinity in the ocean. And the stronger the gradients, uh, the stronger the mixing, the stronger your, your diffusivity, the stronger the mixing. Now, the ocean also has these kind of spoons. And these spoons in the oceans are, for example, the, the ocean eddies, the mesoscale ocean eddies. And um, let me quickly add some, <laughs> add some internet, not mixing, internet to, to our presentation. Um, so the ocean eddies, basically large scale variations of the mean flows of, of 10 to, to say 200 kilometers, um, they also allow properties, warm properties from one location that are uh, normally 200 kilometers away uh, to be close to colder water, warm and cold water, for example and therefore enhancing the molecular diffusion that it would otherwise have to occur on the background and that would take forever. And this diffusivity that is associated with an eddy uh, is about ten, about a thousand meters squared per second. So it could be an order of magnitude larger or lower, but this is the, the standard number, so to speak. But there is also small scale mixing, so the bottom figure. Uh, this is a very beautiful picture by Hans von Hader where uh, you have temperature contours and you can see uh, at this is about 20 on one, two kilometers depth, where you can see a breaking internal wave mixing cold water with warm water. Well, these kind of um, mixing events, you can see all that stirring happening here. Um, these are on the order of 10 to the minus four meters squared per second. So that, that's 10 million times uh, difference in magnitude between those two stirring processes. And still they're both extremely important because the eddies it's harder for them to do something vertically, whereas these internal waves, they break vertically. Uh, so they mix vertically, so they can, for example, add to um, transporting heat to the bottom of the ocean. Um, so uh, we have this, basically this scale separation where we have the massive scale mixing and the, the small scale mixing. And that's how we generally implement it in parameterizations. Um, for here, we see some estimates of these from um, semi-observations. Um, the top figure is by Abernathy and Marshall from 2013, where they have traces released in um, satellite-based uh, geostrophic velocities and look at the resulting mixing of these tracers. And they find, most importantly, that this any mixing, the diffusivity associated with it, is a couple of orders of magnitude and difference and spatially varying a lot. And this is just for the surface. Um, then for those breaking internal waves, we see uh, similar patterns where, where there's very strong spatial variations of orders of magnitude. So it's, it's a problem that extends many orders of magnitude and the whole globe, it's, it's not easy to fix. And in order to know this mixing accurately, we, we basically have to be able to measure it everywhere, which is pretty much impossible because uh, if you want to mix the eddy mixing, the mesoscale, you basically have to release a, a dye somewhere in the water and come back a year later with your ship, measure it again and see how it spread it. And, and you can imagine how much time and effort and money that takes. Um, uh, similar things are true for the vertical diffusivities where you have to go out with a ship and you, you have microstructure profiles that, mis that measure dissipation from which you can diffu get good diffusivities. In other words, it takes a lot of time, effort and money. So we cannot measure the whole globe simultaneously and to get estimates of mixing uh, for these kind of large scales we we need to refer to different solutions and uh, on top of that of course not unsuspected um, mixing is also temporally variable both mesoscale mixing as a recent paper showed by Buseke and Abernathy uh, but uh, the lower unpublished work at the moment also shows that in time at one location the vertical mixing by those for example, breaking into the waves can also vary orders of magnitude. So it's it's um, it 
it's, it's very variable. <laughs> That's the conclusion. Uh, so, what's the problem? Well, uh, direct observations of mixing are very difficult to obtain. Um, because of that, observations are sparse in time and space, and parameterizations are unconstrained. So, ongoing efforts are to indirectly estimate mixing by combining theory with easier to measure observations, for example, temperature, salinity, pressure. Uh, making the observations cheaper and autonomic uh, would also be a solution, but that is very difficult. And remember again, we want this because this mixing influences lots of stuff that we care about. It's important for important things. Um, okay, so today we'll mostly talk about mesoscale mixing, um, an indirect estimate of mesoscale mixing from theory and observations. It's work that I've been doing with Joe Lucas, uh, Trevor McDougall and Marine Roger, um, and that's going to be the main topic of today. But we're not going to start about that just yet. Um, because I just want to tell you that I also work a lot on inverse methods. Now, I'm not going to go into details what inverse methods are, uh, but they, they were often used to get global scale circulation patterns from um, temperature and salinity. And now uh, our, our coverage of temperature, salinity, and other uh, traces, our observations of them, have increased to such an extent that we can now also start to estimate mixing from these uh, kind of inverse methods. And um, uh, one method that I developed was, was the first one that was able to produce global uh, estimates of both small scale and mesoscale mixing. Uh, but it was globally integrated and of course it had some caveats like, like almost every method. Um, so I started working on a new inverse method, uh, which is quite exciting new work if I may say so, and I'm gonna show you a quick preliminary result figure. This is for the nature region, the North Atlantic tracer release experiment region, and all those black dots, they are in fact uh, measurements that they did by releasing a dye. And the two uh, pointed towards with an arrow at the bottom, um, those are results coming from my new inverse method that I'm currently working on. Uh, but again, this is very preliminary results and um, those error bars can reduce a lot if I, if I do a better job. Um, but that's going to be work for a PhD student in the near future. And finally, Jan Zika also uh, developed a tracer contour method. And the beautiful thing is all these methods can hopefully in the future be combined to estimate mixing globally. And that's, that's one thing that I'm working on at the moment as well. Uh, finally, uh, the other thing that I hope to do at the NEOS is to find a very different way to measure um, small-scale dissipation and be able to put that on Argo float so we can get a more global co coverage. Of course, everybody wants that. Nothing is certain that we'll make it, uh, but we have some ideas and we're working on that. Okay, so to, to summarize the introduction very much, um, for physical and practical purposes, Mixing is generally split into small-scale mixing and mesoscale mixing. Now, mixing is a fundamental process. Uh, I like to call it fundamental because it, it, it occurs on the smallest scales, on the molecular scales, but it influences the planetary scales all the way to the climate system. So it's fundamental in both senses. Um, but because it's so small, we can never calculate it directly in, a, in our climate models, and it has to be parameterized. Um, but these parameterized, they're often unconstrained because they, they have tuning parameters and, and we'll probably never get around that, but uh, we need to find ways to constrain these. Um, and observations are one such way, but observations are very difficult um, to get. So we need to estimate this mixing from observations that are available. And today we'll be talking about one such method. Okay. So it's a method, I should go back one slide, sorry. Um, it's a met method that will constrain a form of a parameterization of mesoscale mixing uh, using readily available observations and also direct observations of this mixing from this nature region and another region called dives that we'll come back to later. So it's a combination of theory, um, available observations and those hard to get observations. And that's what we'll talk about in the next 50 minutes. So we will start estimating these. So we're talking about this mesoscale any mixing. Those are the diffusivities that we're going to try to estimate. So we're going to forget the small scale stuff for now. And uh, the closure for geostrophic turbulence, because that's the scale we're looking at, um, often used is the mixing length theory from Prandtl. 
and it means we're talking about a diffusivity that is a mixing efficiency times uh, the root mean square juice root mean square geostrophic eddy velocity uh, times the mixing length and this is the length scale of the eddies so basically you're, you're looking at how fast parcels can stir around and you multiply that with some kind of efficiency of the mixing that is going on um, however this is not complete and Ferrari and Icarusian a decade ago derived a very important contribution to this uh, the fact that um, the background flow can suppress this eddy mix these eddy diffusivities and um, that term is then expressed here where you can insert that mixing length theory at the top and then it's divided by something that will make it smaller than one uh, smaller than its original value um, which is uh, depending on the, the basically the speed of those eddies and uh, the difference with the background mean flow and it can lead to some sort of a Doppler shift that reduces uh, the diffusivities if I say that correct and in here uh, we have the Rossby wavelength scale we have the eddy decorrelation time scale we have the Doppler shift at Rossby wave speed and we have the large scale mean flow now, so far, all these theories have been used. Um, they're reasonably well understood. And um, uh, the next step is basically to try and apply them to observations. And that's what we'll do here. So our next step is to try and estimate these variables from observations. Um, to do this, we, we follow Ferrari and Nucarusian. Um, and use that this parameterization can be used full depth. If the original mixing, K-mix, uh, varies vertically, if the background flow varies vertically, but the Doppler shifted Rossby wave speed has to be the, the one that you get at the surface. Okay, so now let's get those variables. The mixing efficiency, we'll just set it to 0.35 um, based on reasoning by Clocker and Abernathy and what they found in their papers. The mixing length scale is basically the size of the eddies, which is represented by the Rossby radius of deformation. Um, the root mean square velocity is your horizontal geostrophic eddy velocity that you can get from satellite data. Um, but what the satellite data will only give you that what you know at the surface. So we need to know what the vertical structure of that is. And for this, uh, we will use the vertical structure of the horizontal geostrophic eddy velocity represented by phi multiplied by the surface horizontal geostrophic eddy velocity. Now, to be able to do this, of course, you need to get that vertical structure, and that's not trivial. Um, but that's what I've been working on with Joe Lacasse, basically. And um, that's what we'll talk to you about now, because we can get these using linear quasi-geostrophic potential vorticity theory. Um, and this is where it gets quite nice. Uh, meanwhile, I'm trying to um, see if my internet is still working yep okay so linear quasi geostrophic potential vorticity equation is, has been around for a long time um, and it's been solved by many people and it's the equation we see here on the left where n squared is the main input uh, and n squared is the equation on the right and n squared is the vertical stratification um, normally the solution to this is to use a flat bottom so we ne neglect bottom topography and that means that your um, boundary conditions um, the phi dz is zero for bo both at the bottom and at the surface and in order for your first baroclinic mode that results from this not to be uh, less than zero not to be negative they tend to add a biotropic mode to this however um, bathymetry is important and indeed uh, it shows that the EOFs, so the, the first mode of variation in, from current meters, from vertical uh, velocity measurements that we have, uh, we can see that it is much better represented by using a rough bottom solution. That means that we have to change the boundary condition. So the boundary condition at the surface remains the same, but the boundary condition at the, at the bottom uh, means that the flow is zero. And rough bottom, in this case, means that the uh, topography has to be 10 to the minus third meter per meter of changes and it turns out that if you include both large-scale topography and small bumps everywhere that this is valid almost everywhere in the world so this way of solving this equation 
using this rough bottom approximation with phi zero at the bottom boundary condition, uh, work that, that Joe Lacaz has been involved in a lot, uh, turns out to be valid for, for almost everywhere in the ocean. And that's why we use this for our vertical modes. And these vertical modes will just be basically one at the top and uh, they will go to zero at the bottom. And I'll show you some examples in a moment. And to be able to uh, solve for this equation, we use a fourth order run Chikata step from the bottom up using Newton's method to converge to a solution that satisfies the boundary conditions. And this includes the transcendent equations to solve for C. Um, it's all it's all a bit messy and stuff, but you can do it. And um, we've done it recently, and there's one or two papers out there have done this, and it works. And from this, from once you got C as well, you can also get your deformation radius. So from this quasi geostrophic potential fortissity, from solving this equation using rough bottom boundary condition, you can get both the deformation radius and your vertical structure of your eddies. So this is how the deformation radius looks like. Uh, latitude, longitude, we see very high values near the equator. That's because in this you divide by f basically, so it blows up. Uh, and with latitude, you see the, the deformation radius decrease. And this is a uh, very familiar figures that we've seen before. Uh, so this all makes sense. And you can see the order 100 to 10 kilometers for the eddy sizes. Um, and here, I just want you to look at the right hand side, which is those called profiles. And here you can see um, the profiles that start with one at the top and they go to zero and what shows is the normalized depth and you can see they vary quite a bit and that depends on the stratification and we'll talk about that later but this is how those vertical profiles what they look like okay so this is cool because now we have that parameterization but right hand side uh, we've done that now we've got the mixing efficiency we've got the Rossby radius of deformation and um, with satellite data, we can get the eddy kinetic energy, and we now have the vertical structure uh, of your eddies. So pretty much, we've only used temperature, salinity, pressure, and eddy kinetic energy at the surface from satellite data, and we've got um, um, the, the unsuppressed effusivities. So we still need to work on this suppression factor. Well, this is doable because uh, the phase speed is given by the, the Doppler shifted Rossby wave speed um, is given by this equation here where the big U is the background mean flow um, but then depth and time mean um, and normally you would get these values from a Hofmuller diagram where you track these eddies in, in space and time uh, but Clocker and Marshall showed in a very short paper that this approximation that you show here uh, is, is reasonably well actually to get this phase speed so that's what we use. Um, this background flow is just gotten from a thermal wind uh, reference to the surface but uh, so we start the integration at the surface but the nice thing is because CW minus U is in there uh, the surface the reference velocity at the surface that you need to get a total velocity actually drops out so that reduces the um, uh, errors that you would get from trying to also estimate a surface velocity um, then uh, the Rossby wavelength is uh, 2 pi over the Rossby radius that's what we uh, approximated and then finally, the only one left then is the eddy decorrelation time scale. And this is the only parameter we fit. And how we fit it exactly, I will show you later. But we got 1.66 days, uh, which is comparable to the four days found by Clocker and Abernathy. But we have three dimensional results and they looked only at the surface. So that could probably explain some of those differences. Um, okay. So now what we have is we have what I call K-Rossby, which is the diffusivity uh, estimate. And then we have this expression here with all things that we know. And then we take the minimum of Sx, Sy, which is the suppression factor. So we've rewritten it a little bit. And we can see the expressions of that in the second row. Um, and in that expression, we can also see that delta V and delta U, which is that um, that mean velocity minus that vertical profile. Uh, so basically, you filled in all these numbers of the previous slide. Um, and these are all things that we know. So why the one thing I need to say, why do we take the minimum of those, uh, one of those suppression directions? 
is because normally um, you would like to look at um, the minor axis of the ellipse because the, the this this any mixing is is cross the cross the mean flow direction strong flow direction uh, but we don't have that at the moment we tried to get it from satellite data it was a bit too noisy it didn't work uh, so we use this approach which has also been used by other authors in the literature and I think that includes uh, Clocker and Abernathy um, and this seems to work well as I will show you in a minute um, and again so far the input has only been temperature salinity pressure which we have a lot of and eddy kinetic energy um, okay so the parameterization is up there then we have our expression uh, for what we call diffusivity ROS B that we just explained but there's one more problem at the equator the deformation radius goes to infinity now that that doesn't work very well uh, to get estimates so at the equator we got to do something else and the thing is at the equator um, the eddies well normally the the growth rate of the eddies is limited by this deformation radius but at the equator because this deformation radius goes to infinity that is no longer the limiting factor in the eddy growth but at the equator um, what 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 is more dominant is the Rhine scale basically what is happening is that uh, the eddies start feeling the latitudinal change of the Coriolis force or the beta effect and that will tear them apart pretty much and because of that um, they can grow to a certain size and this size is given by the Rhine scale so near the equator we have to replace this theory that we just had with the expression below where with some mixing efficiency times the root mean square root times the Rhine scale so here we assume that this Prandtl mixing theory is still valid uh, we don't have suppression in here uh, directly and uh, what we do is once r is larger than one basically once the Rhine scale becomes the limiting factor we switch to the Rhine's expression of the diffusivity um, and we use this this gamma equator to do fitting because what happens is basically you come from south or from north you move towards the equator and at some point um, you transfer to the Rhine scale and at that point you fit the gamma equation to, to make it this transition continuous um, and and that's how we do it and then we get a new result um, I have to say we still have to take care about our results near the equator it's not perfect but it seems to be a reasonable reasonable step forward compared to nothing um, so this is the final expression where the final diffusivity is given by this Rossby diffusivity unless we're near the equator it gives them by this Ryan's diffusivity so let's start to look at the results so I used World Ocean Atlas 2018 temperature salinity pressure and I used some annual annual means and I also used annual mean eddy kinetic energies from surf satellite data I don't know by heart which product I use I'm sorry um, but I combined that we did all these calculations we did all these these solving for these modes these deformation ranges put it all together and looked at the results and then we fit it because we still have this gamma fit and this gamma fit is basically in this figure so look at the pink color that is our results whereas the black dots in both regions so we're looking at sorry we're looking at the nature region the North Atlantic trace release experiment and we're looking at the Dimes region, which is in the Southern Ocean. And in both regions, there are direct estimates from, from dye releases and, and, and boats going there and stuff of this mixing. Those are indicated in black. And what we did is we fitted our results for those black dots only to minimize the difference, basically, for, those, for both regions simultaneously. And that gave us the gamma of 1.66. So yes, you could argue that we cheat a little bit in this figure by making it look nice in this figure, but then again, it actually does. The, the, we, we can't say too much about a vertical shape and where the suppression is happening. So it's, it's, it's a really great fit when we look at the pink overlying the black. And we were amazingly surprised how well this goes. And also, look at the difference if you do not use suppression. So the, the sort of the orangey color um, is the version of our results but without using suppression and you can see it's, it's much less good 
uh, the pink one is really good and uh, in the dimes region you can see that it captures this subsurface maximum due to the suppression factor really nicely and there is not any of the other theories and these estimates that are in this figure that I'm not going to talk about all of them but none of them basically captured this that's this well and this accurately so we were really happy uh, to see how well these vertical modes in combination with the suppression factor and everything is working. Okay, um, so let's quickly look at, so this is all from World Ocean Atlas, right? This is the unsuppressed values. Um, so this just means the largest values at the surface and it decays with that. Uh, we can see a map. Um, the, the top figure is a map of this with high values ranging between 10 to 10,000 or more. And the one at the bottom is a transect, and a transect is in the Atlantic, and you can see the stripe, and you can also see the boxes indicating the dimes in the nature region. Um, sorry, nature and dimes region. Um, meanwhile, I am checking my internet again. So, we're not that interested in these values, we're actually more interested in um, the suppressed values because they're physically more realistic. And this is the suppression factor that we get out of it, where we can see in this red circle beautifully the strong suppression that we expect in the Southern Ocean. And um, if we look at the transect again, we can see beautifully uh, that the white color indicates basically no suppression, the blue color indicates strong suppression, and we can see uh, the subsurface, there is no suppression allowing for a subsurface maximum of your depressivities, uh, which comes out very nicely here, in fact. Um, so we were very happy to see this as well. And we can see the result of this in our estimates of the depressivities. So here are our final estimates, or uh, parts of them anyway. Uh, we have the same map again, but now suppressed. And we see some very cool features. So, for example, we see the effect of suppression in the Southern Ocean very clearly in this red circle, but we also see near the Agulas, uh, the south tip of Africa here, we see uh, where well, we know there's a lot of eddy mixing going on, and we see those highlighted here as well, and we see the, the suppression going on there. Very good. We also see this patch of, of very low mixing in the North Pacific, and we see the Gulf Stream, we see strong mixing, and next to it, very low mixing. And these are patterns that we can also find in the results from Abernathy and uh, Marshall, and also from uh, Clocker and Abernathy. And also here in the Gulf Stream, they have this, this similar structure, and they only get values at the surface, but those at the surface look very much like what we find. And look at that bit near New Zealand here, where they have these low values next to these high values, and we find very similar patterns. So this is all very, um, convincing I think that our method is doing something right so we're very happy with that and of course in the vertical now we can see this subsurface maximum in uh, the Southern Ocean where we expect this so again we only have temperature salinity pressure and we're getting really good estimates of mixing this is amazing um, just near the equator as you can see the stripey behavior this is not ideal it's it's definitely representing something realistic um, but it's not ideal so that needs work Okay, we're almost there. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was this vertical structure. So what, what's really new, like what a lot of people have done, they've already looked at a lot of these things, but hardly anybody has actually uh, done a good job of implementing this vertical structure. Um, as far as I know, anyway, maybe I've missed something. Um, and, and so this is really interesting. So what this picture is telling us is the following. These are those modes that we solved from using the linear quasi geostrophic potential vorticity equation. And this shows you at which depth normalized to the local depth um, your eddy mixing has reduced by 90%. So the red areas, you can see the color bar here. If it's red, it means, for example, uh, let's, let's look at the gyre here. Uh, it's about 0 0.3, 0 0.4. So it means in 0.3 or 0.4 of the local depth, the eddy mixing, the eddy diffusivity has reduced by 90%. So very strong surface intensification of eddy mixing. And that's what this is telling us. This map is telling us the, the, the rate of surface intensification or the rate of vertical decay of the strength of eddy mixing. And we can see some, some really fascinating features here. 
And uh, don't forget, the only thing that really goes into this is the stratification. So uh, one thing that stands out is that around 20 to 30 north and south, we see very strong um, near surface intensification of any mixing. And uh, this coincides with, with regions where stratification is relatively strong near the surface compared to the deep ocean. Now, there's a notable exception, which is the South Atlantic, where you see the East Atlantic and the West Atlantic. Now, the West Atlantic uh, here has, doesn't have as strong surface intensification as, for example, the East Atlantic over there. And this is super interesting because the reason for this is that Antarctic bottom water moves northward here so and Antarctic bottom water is associated with stronger stratification now to understand this we need to know how we basically the result that we got from the Marunch Kata um, if you use the WKB solution to get to similar results um, the result looks like um, the root of n multiplied by the sine of the integral of the stratification from bottom to surface. So in other words, you, it's, it's more or less proportional to the integral of n, which means that if you have very strong stratification at the surface, that's where, where most of your, your weight will go to, uh, but then it suddenly has to rapidly decay with depth to reach its boundary condition of being zero at the, surf, at the bottom. Whereas if um, it's more uniformly stratified, um, this decay is, is, is more linear. It's not as surface intensified. And uh, that is basically what we're seeing here because this intrusion of Antarctic bottom water uh, um, downweighs the effect of the, the very strong stratification near the surface, allowing for a slightly smoother decay with depth. And that is interesting because the stratification is basically set. Uh, well, let's, let's take one step back. What this is telling us is that relatively strong surface stratification causes surface intensification of any mixing. So way stronger mixing near the surface than at depth. If this stratification is more uniform, any mixing seems to be able to mix more uniformly with depth. This is, this is re relatively new for us. Um, which would suggest that the stratification set by the large scale influences like circulation and vertical mixing and wind and other things have a strong influence on the vertical extent of eddy mixing. So if an eddy is moving from A to B and it crosses the from East to West Atlantic, um, its, its ability to mix in the vertical is, is very different depending on the local stratification. And that's something we trying to understand here a little bit more, uh, which is quite new. Okay, so we're getting to the conclusions now. We have a new parameterization uh, for mesoscale eddy diffusivity. We only use observations of temperature, salinity, pressure, and eddy kinetic energy. Okay, cheat a little bit. We also use direct estimates to fit. Um, but these are widely and readily available observations. Uh, the results match the direct observations very well, but also lots of features we see in other estimates. Um, the nice thing about what we have is it's full depth and it has global coverage. It's admittedly not as good near the equator, but uh, we're, we're making some first steps and I think in future work we, we can make even more and better steps to improve this uh, but what we have here is already a, a nice improvement um, and we find that the suppression flow suppression is very important but also that the surface intensification so these vertical modes are essential and we cannot live without them basically in our numerical modeling and other studies that use mixing um, and this in itself suggests that large scale stratification influences uh, any mixing and its ability to mix in the vertical. Um, thank you. So I had some more slides about the Northern European Enclosure Dam and stuff, um, but because of time I'm not going to talk about that. So um, I'll sit here and wait for your questions if they come and um, I, I thank you for joining and listening. This was a strange experience, but very cool. I am reading questions from the chat box on 
Twitch, if there are any. If not, you can always email me, shootruskamp at gmail, or you can go to my website and you can find my contact details as well. Okay, so the question here is uh, from Roth is um, that Lacasse's rough bottom modes are not always valid. Um, I know Joe would uh, not agree with that, and uh, this is an ongoing discussion. Um, I would have to ask him if I can send you our recent paper, which um, hopefully does a better job of convincing that for most of the ocean this is actually the case especially when you include um, the effect of bumps so you have to you have the general topography where for lots of regions the 10 to the minus third is reached but then on top of that um, if you have bumps of about five meters over 10 kilometers that is enough uh, for this bottom boundary condition to be valid now um, so th that's our argument that uh, for most of the ocean this this is the right way of doing it now, if um, flat bottom modes have to be used, uh, we have to wonder if this is possible at all, because uh, flat bottoms, they don't have a boundary condition of, of zero at the bottom. They will go negative towards the bottom. Um, and you need to, to, to add the bare tropic mode to somehow get to zero there. Um, that's the only way you could use that, I think. But questions are is that if that's adding an arbitrary number or not and if that's um, valid for the kind of work we do so this this does rely on the fact that these um, bottom that these modes um, require a rough bottom boundary condition but current meters seem to support this a lot um, so so we are convinced that this is the case I'm sorry if that if you're not um, that's fine and, and, and I would, wouldn't mind talking about that a little bit more offline. So um, I get a, a question from Clark Richards. Um, let me read it for a second. <laughs> what do you expect the effect to be of the decreasing Rossby radius at higher latitudes compared to the altimetry scale? so that the eddy kinetic energy isn't going to be properly resolved. Um, I don't know. Um, so far, the estimate that we have seems to be quite valid compared to other um, estimates for the deformation radius, at high, also at high latitudes. But at some point, of course, we, we, we won't be able to cover it anymore. And then if we, if we can't get the deformation radius, then um, this method won't work and we'll have to find different solutions to apply this. So um, in that sense, when I say this is global, and I do believe this is global, but of course that is under the assumptions that all the ingredients that go in here are valid for the regions for which we calculate um, these diffusivities. And uh, we have some data gaps, especially at high latitudes in indeed. Um, and near the equator, uh, some of the geostrophic assumptions break down, so we have to switch to this other type of doing it. And that, at this moment, is as good as we can get. So I think the method would work, but the data may not allow us. If that's an answer to your question. Hello? All right. I don't see any more questions popping up. I hope you enjoyed it for the ones who are still here. Um, 
Thanks. Thanks a lot for joining. And um, thanks, uh, David, for organizing it this way in under these conditions in the world at the moment. Um, this way we can keep science going. So thank you. <laughs>